Okay, so now we will discuss about race and ethnicity. And of course, as usual, this video is just to be able to contextualize the lessons that you've learned from Nicole's uh, lecture on crash course. But also, I would uh, also include some concepts that she was not able to cover for this specific topic. Now, of course, the crash course video has given you the accurate um, definitions of race uh, being the biological traits that are used for social categorization on certain traits that are uh, deemed by society as important. And usually, this is the color of the skin. In the Philippines, racial stratification isn't as um, widespread or as emphasized as in Western countries such as the United States and some parts of Europe. But in the Philippines, we do have what we call colorism. And colorism basically is the prejudice and judgment that we attach to people uh, because they have certain skin color. And in the Philippines, we highly value skin colors that are fairer uh, compared to those who are darker. However, that issue isn't as institutionalized and as ingrained into the oppressive structures of society as compared to what we see in racial um, discrimination in America. Next, uh, Nicole was also able to define about ethnicity and this is about the social stratification in relation to the cultural heritage of the persons being categorized. And in the Philippines, our basis for uh, ethnic groupings or ethnic categorization is based on ethno-linguistic groups or we usually um, categorize ethnicity based on the type of language that they use. And in the Philippines also, we have what we call multiple identities. We have multiracial identities like for example, uh, Chinois or the Filipino Chinese. And we also have transnational identities like for example, um, uh, Phil Americans. Also in the video, uh, we were able to learn that certain racial or uh, ethnic categories are regarded as minority groups in a given society. I would like to give more criteria on how do we say a certain racial, ethnic, or social category group is considered a minority. So first, uh, people who belong to a minority group have an equal treatment and less power over their lives compared to a dominant culture. So for example, uh, Filipinos coming from an urban society such as NCR usually have a higher education, they have a better income state, and they have better uh, employment opportunities compared to indigenous peoples. You know, indigenous peoples, they usually don't have access to education and therefore that, uh, in, that contributes to their disempowerment. So yeah, that's an example. That's first um, ka criteria on minoritization of certain groups. So the next criteria for minority groups is that they should have some sort of distinguishing physical or cultural traits like skin color or language. Now, for example, uh, indigenous groups who are considered minority groups in the Philippines may have a different, you know, biological traits uh, compared to dominant. Uh, cultures in the Philippines, like for example, in the picture you see here, no, a uh, Igorot or an Aita uh, individual having dark skin, curly hair, that usually is an identifier that they belong to a certain uh, group that is considered as a minority. Another identifier is their language. For example, their inability to speak in English or Tagalog or having a certain accent, like for example, Bisaya, can also um, identify them as a member of another cultural group. And sometimes when they have an, really, uh, have an interaction with a dominant culture, you know, and they see that type of accent or that language as, you know, less acceptable or uh, less dominant, then they usually get ridic uh, ridiculed for their accent or for their language. Next is involuntary membership in the group meaning um, they were born in that cultural group or they were born in that uh, racial group. Next is that they are aware that they are subordinate. 
of a dominant group. So again, remember, dominant group is not necessarily in relation to number in a given society because for instance you know filipino chinese as a uh, specific uh, multiracial or transnational group in the philippines they are of lesser population but it doesn't necessarily mean that they are minority group no because they know and they know that they're dominant in relation to income and employment opportunities compared to the rest of the population and also number five there should be high rate of in-group marriage in that group because the tendency is they cannot marry outside their cultural group because usually the other cultural groups do not like to marry within their group. So there's high rates of intercultural or in-group marriage. So what is the Filipino race? No. So the Filipino race is argued to be Austronesian. I point here asterisks up to now there are many critics saying that we are not really Austronesian. Austronesian meaning you know um, coming from the Pacific and then moving to Taiwan and then from the from Taiwan going to the Philippines no and generally we're called the Malay race no but again there are also a lot of contentions in relation to that so at the moment what is accepted is that the general Philippine race no prior to you know uh Spanish colonization is that we're coming from an Austronesian descent and I've just listed common indigenous minority groups from each island group. Like for example, for Luzon, we have the Aita, Ibanag, Dumagat, Agta, and Mangyan. And then also in Visayas, we have the Karaya and the Eskaya, who are also considered as minority um, ethnolinguistic groups in Visayas. And in, in Mindanao, we have the Higaonon, the Manobo, and of course the Lumads, who are of course experiencing a lot of disempowerment. Uh, in relation to their ancestral lands, no, they are being uh, relocated or displaced from their very own ancestral lands by different corporations, and also um, their their schools are also being closed down because um, uh, of certain political um, issues in relation to their existence in that area. And of course, we discussed also about how we react. To differences in relation to cultural background, race, and, and ethnicity. And basically, uh, in relation to other uh, cultures, we can have what we call prejudices. And prejudices are beliefs that we have um, against or for a given cultural group. You know? And we have uh, explicit biases and implicit biases. When we say explicit biases, these are the uh, the actual articulated um, beliefs that we have against a certain groups. Like for example, probably your belief is, ah, yung mga indigenous groups natin, wala silang pinag-aralan, they don't know much, or they're not educated. So that's an articulated explicit bias. Another form of bias is what we call implicit bias, and these are the biases that we may even not know about. For example, when we see, let's say, uh, homeless uh, indigenous people who have migrated to NCR and they start walking to you, you started running away, okay? Or you probably start, you know, checking your pockets. Uh, and these, aren't, these are just feelings that you have towards them and probably don't accept them as the beliefs. But these are subconscious actions that we do when certain minority groups are around. This can also be considered as what we call microaggressions. And of course, stemming from our prejudices, we can also have stereotypes or unfounded generalizations about a certain group of people. No, like for example, I Visaya, I usually yan mga katulong. And of course, that's largely untrue. Uh, I have, uh, I have interacted with and I've had, you know, very good students and colleagues who happen to also come from the Visayan region and the Mindanao region. So stereotypes are usually generalized um, ideas about a group of people, which is not necessarily true. And of course, um, stereotypes doesn't only come together with racial or ethnic groups. It also comes with gender categories. Like for example, we also have stereotypes about females, 
about males, about LGBTQIA people, about old and young people, about millennials. And uh, we usually lump them together in one belief. And these are called your stereotypes. And stereotypes can be, of course, uh, be a form of explicit bias, as in we know them and we deeply hold them, and they could also be implicit bias. This could have been deeply seated in our subconscious that has been taught to us by the many socializations that we've had. And then when our beliefs turn into action, that becomes discrimination. And discrimination has many types. Now we have one, we have individual discrimination. This is, you know, a person or a group of people like uh, saying racial slurs against a person, no, uh, blurting out their stereotypical beliefs about a certain group. So this is an individual discrimination or hurting or worse, hate crime against a group of people. So that's an individual discrimination. We also have what we call an institutional discrimination wherein basically, you know, uh, the, the structure of society um, places, you know, a whole group in a disadvantage. So, for example, of institutional discrimination is, for instance, you know, in a in a Catholic school, they do not um, hire uh, a Muslim or a non-Catholic teacher. So that's an example of institutional discrimination. You know, it is the system that is supported by the academic freedom clause of our constitution that allows them. To not hire a certain religious group. Next, we have what we call internalized stigma. So, internalized stigma is the person internalizing the uh, prejudices that other people towards uh, that the other people have towards their group or their person. So, internalized stigma, for instance, is um, let's say a uh, a an, an cultural minority. Um, actively avoiding situations wherein that person has to uh, mingle with people because she feels or she feels like she is not good enough to be able to interact with these people. No? She already has internalized all the prejudices that society has for him or her. So that's called internalized stigma. And of course, internalized stigma can result to many other mental problems like for example low self-esteem depression and anxiety feeling of hopelessness and powerlessness and of course any form of discrimination that is based on race and ethnicity or color is called racism now when you are discriminatory against a uh, against a certain gender or sex you are a sexist or you're practicing sexism or if you are um, prejudiced against or discriminatory against the LGBTQIA community usually we call it cis heterosexism no? hetero means um, uh, I, the ideology that heterosexual uh, relationships are the only positively sanctionable relationships in society and cis is only cisgender and you know uh, not accepting trans related behaviors and lifestyles so these are also types of discrimination but the basis is not race the basis is on sex and um, sexual desire and gender identity which we will be discussing in the next lecture now also we have uh, learned from the crash course video that there are multiple theories that can explain uh, intergroup relations that are hostile. No? The first one, we have the scapegoat theory and usually this is the dominant culture um, blaming all the bad things happening in their society to those who are minorities. Now, for example, of course, in terms of Trump, you know, he is forcing the narrative that the reason why there's high unemployment and low economic progress in the United States is because the immigrants are the ones taking economic opportunities to, you know, the dominant culture that is uh, present. No? Another would be Hitler who placed the blame uh, on the downfall of Germany among the Jews causing, of course, the Holocaust. And of course, in the Philippines, no, 
we have our president you know blaming minority groups like uh, drug users you no know? and usually they're minority groups because they're coming from poor uh poor communities and you know blaming all of our society's problems to these people who are doing and are addicted to drugs so that's an example of scapegoat theory blaming minority groups for the problems of dominant culture next also in uh in addition to scapegoat theory is that we also have the authoritarian personality theory and usually if we look up to authoritarian an authoritarian personality and that authoritarian personality has a racist a sexist or a discriminatory belief you know usually uh, people who are on the fence about a certain uh, social problem would usually listen to these authoritarian figures and of course in our, in our global society right now there's a rise of authoritarian leaders like uh, the ones that you can see in the picture of this um, of this slide so yeah that's also um, another theory that can explain why we have discriminatory behaviors towards certain groups next we have the culture theory of prejudice generally saying that you know prejudice is enculturated you know in the dominant culture this is something that is seen in our institution normalized in our everyday living in all sectors we see this in schools we see this in homes we see this in churches right for example in churches sinong uupo sa harapan usually it's the rich and elite people of the community and usually the poor people we're supposed to be what the church is serving those who cannot wear a good clothes are usually placed at the back or are standing outside the church so uh, this is an example of culture theory of prejudice another theory that was offered in relation to the attitudes that we have towards minority groups is about uh, social distance by Bogartus and definitely this is a different social distance from what we are talking about during this COVID-19 pandemic this is actually how a certain person views himself as um, the same or different than the person or the group that he is referring to and of course usually when a certain person believes that this other person or this other group is different usually we do what we call othering othering means that uh, we we place them in an out group uh, we give them an out group label and we do not reach out to them we do not treat them as how we would treat uh, people in our in groups so that's an example of social distance and then of course you know we have conflict theory that explains that the reason that uh, usually there is racism there is discriminatory behavior because it is the uh, attempt of dominant cultures to um to maintain their center of power and the resources that they have within themselves and you know so the while they do that they maintain the oppressive nature that they have towards this minority group so that they can keep the power to themselves and also make use of these minority groups to you know get more power now can structural functionalism help us in terms of um explaining why there's racism and discriminatory behavior probably not much because again if when you say structural functionalism it means that um are we saying that there is a functional um significance of racism and discrimination in society i believe there's none no it's very oppressive you know um next can symbolic interactionism help us in explaining why there's racism in a way yes now remember that race is socially constructed and usually it is in the social meanings that we place in things and behaviors that usually say whether this person should be oppressed or should be minoritized and of course as we as we explain no, uh, it is not really just biology that tells us that you know this type of biological makeup really makes you inferior we only just nitpick and choose certain biological traits like for example skin color and then we attach a meaning that this is more important than the other so this is an example of symbolic interactionism as as it can apply to racism 
Now, going back to conflict theory, usually racial lines go parallel with other forms of inequality. Like, for example, in the United States, usually we see poorer health outcomes, poorer educational outcomes uh, among people of color compared to the dominant culture or the white race. And this is the same with the Philippines. Usually, the indigenous groups, they have poorer health outcomes, poorer educational outcomes, poorer literacy rates, you know, and poorer employment opportunities compared to the dominant urban culture that we have. And again, this uh, further explains uh, and supports, you know, the, the principle of conflict theory that, again, it is at the power elites or the elites of society that identify who should have the power and opportunities and the privilege. Mm -hmm. Now also Nicole explained that uh, when cultures interact with each other, they can interact with hostility and they can also interact positively when they are placed in a shared space. No? For example, of a very diverse space or society that has multiple cultures is Canada, United States, you know, and the United Kingdom. Now, intergroup hostility, these are the actions. First, genocide. Of course, genocide simply says killing or an eradication of the lives of the minorities. You know? And of course, one of the more um, popular genocides that we had in the past is of course the holocaust and now we are still seeing a lot of genocidal um, behaviors you know? for example the Uyghur Muslims in China are also reported to be um, genocide, uh, experiencing genocide you know, in China um, next is expulsion meaning of expulsion is that they are being set out of the area you know? they are being pushed away you no. Know? and claiming the land or the space as theirs, or as the dominant culture. Next, we have segregation. So segregation means um, you only limit the access of certain minority groups um, in relation to different services. Like for example, a lot of segregation has happened in the Jim Crow laws in the early 1900s in the United States were in uh, black Americans are only able to access select schools, select CRs, you know, select churches, select hospitals. And they can only uh, own land based on the area that is not so good uh, in terms of economic value. And of course, these laws have caused to further um, increase the inequality between uh, whites and people of color in the United States. Now, the next three is, you know, positive intercultural relations. So, the first one is assimilation and accommodation. When we say assimilation, the minority group will take on the characteristics of the dominant group so that they will be able to live in harmony with them. So, an example of assimilation is, for example, the Filipino migrants in the States, they learn how to speak in English. They assimilate the ways and the behaviors that they have in order for them to uh, in order for them to move freer you know? and then taking some of the cultural traits of the American so that's an example of assimilation you no know? this is minority groups taking in cultural traits from the dominant culture next we also have what we call accommodation accommodation is the dominant culture allowing uh, minority cultures to have cultural expressions in the shared space that they have. Next, we have accommodation. So, what does accommodation mean? Accommodation means it's the dominant culture allowing minority cultures to be able to have some sort of cultural expressions. So for example, when a certain team, no, uh, a team of workers would decide on a meeting day and everyone is okay at 6 p.m. However, there was is one member of the team who's Muslim and he says, 6 p.m. is my prayer time. And they said, okay, let's move the meeting some other time so that you'll be able to attend and let's rearrange the schedule. That's an example of accommodation. We're allowing that person to have some prayer time 
because we are allowing him to do his cultural and religious practices and we respect the practices. Next, we have pluralism. When we say pluralism, this is when, you know, cultures coexist with each other and they, no one is um, batting an eye whether that, um, that culture is there doing their cultural practice. They're being, uh, every culture is allowed to flourish, you know, and keep their unique identity. When we say amalgamation, this is the what we call the melting pot. This is all cultures coming together, forming one holistic culture. And of course, that's also a little bit problematic because in amalgamation, some cultural traits of certain minority cultures are usually given up so that they can have one shared culture. So usually, the more acceptable uh, intercultural relation is more on the pluralism wherein we just let the other cultures be as long as it doesn't um, hurt the law of the land and hurt other cultural groups. Now from racial stratification, let's move to age stratification. So another way for us to be able to uh, categorize people in a society is through age. And of course, we give lots of meaning based on uh, the age of a certain person. And currently, we have uh, different generational cohorts that are sharing a space in society. And these are the generational cohorts. The first one, we have the greatest generation. And these are those who are currently 77 years old and up. So they are born before 1944. So these are the people who have experienced World War II and the closing of World War II. Next, we have the baby boomers. And the baby boomers are now 56 to 76 years old as of, um, as of 2019. And they are born between 1944 to 1964. So what are the historical events that influenced uh, the lives of baby boomers siyempre, is the rebuilding of the different societies after World War II. In the United States, they were also able to experience the liberation of uh, black Americans. Uh, they are also able to experience a lot of economic prosperity. They are able to own and make use of lands and different types of technologies were already being forwarded and furthered during that time. So this is the uh, historical climate that shaped who the baby boomers are. So that will basically help us why they have a, uh, they have a general attitude that they have right now. Next, we have the Gen X people. And the Gen X are those who are currently 41 to 55 years old. And they were born from 1965 to 1980. So during this time, they were able to experience, you know, the hippie movement. You know, they're also able to experience disco. They're also able to experience a lot of increasing globalization, you know. And this was also the birth of television, etc., etc. And then, of course, we have the Generation Y, or whom we now call as the millennials, who were born from 1981 to 19. 96. So as of now, we millennials are aged 26 to 40 years old. So I'm part of the millennial group. So usually the millennials, um, they, their historical context is that, you know, they were able to see digital revolution um, exploding in their very eyes, right? So, and of course, increasing connectivity uh, with the rest of the world. And now we have you, the Generation Z, or now we call the Zoomers, um, which were born from 1997 to 2015. So this is you. So for the Generation Z people, no, uh, you weren't born in a world without internet. So you were born in a world na may internet na. So you cannot imagine a life without internet. And of course, we have after 2015, we have now the Generation Alpha, the kids. Um, and of course, they will have a different characteristic based on the historical contexts 
that they will be exposed to. And probably, this COVID-19 pandemic, this will also influence you, Generation Z people, and of course, us millennials, because we are going to, you know, accept the economy, whatever it's left of it, after COVID-19 is done. So, these are the different age stratifications in society and the generational cohorts that we have. Remember that the generational cohorts might not be the same with other countries. Like, for example, the experience in categorizing the greatest generation, baby boomers, and generation X may not be the same for other countries. Like, for example, those who only got their independence recently might not have the same experience as those who already had their independence since the end of World War. So I think this one is a little bit arbitrary, this three. No, based on which country or which society we're looking at. But generally, for millennials and Generation Z, because of the increased interconnectivity of the internet and increased globalization, we can say that all over the world, this is uh, this gro- uh, generational cohorts are usually shared. Now, as explained by Nicole, aging is also a very important phenomenon that affects most of the developed world. But the way aging affects the developed world, like America, isn't the same as how it affects us in the developing society, such as in the Philippines. Now, first, in the Philippines, we do have an increasing life expectancy. So when we started in the mid-1900s, our life expectancy was 60 years old. But in the 2000s, our life expectancy is now 70 years old. So there is an increasing life expectancy. But compared to developed countries, developed countries like Japan, Korea, their life expectancy is 80 years old. So, mas mababa pa tayo. However, our society is not yet ready to take care of a graying population as of the moment. We are still building that system. I'll explain that later. Another uh, another rate that, of course, defines the graying population is the general fertility rate. The general fertility rate in the Philippines when we started in the 1960s no, was 8 per female in the Philippines. And dami, no? But now we are in 2.5 per females in the 2000s. Now, this is still relatively higher compared to developed countries. You know, in, in some European countries that are very rich, the fertility rate is less than 1. So, usually, uh, in developed countries, females usually delay childbearing or do not go through childbearing at all. And therefore, in the Philippines specifically, we are not just dealing with aging, we're also dealing with a really uh, big base in our, uh, in our population pyramid. No? Big sabihin, we have a lot of old people, we also have a lot of young people, so we are carrying both burdens in our society in the Philippines. In the Philippines also we can experience gerontocracy or you know the increased uh, amassing of wealth among older people, no? Especially among the affluent classes. And in the Philippines it is also um it is also facilitated by our valuing of our elders. No, we have a really vertical power dynamics. We we put so much respect and regards to our elders. So it's easy for the older people to also um, be abusive of younger generations. And of course, um, it's not always the same for every old person. But generally also that dynamic wherein you know, the old person is trying to talk down a younger person is slowly changing the man over time. Unlike developed countries, you know, Retirement in the Philippines is such a sad thing to talk, talk about, especially for poorer families. You know, usually, um, a lot of those who retire aren't really ready for retirement. And really, retirement pushes them to more poverty in the future. And also, they have already poor health. So, once they get hospitalized because of chronic illnesses, they usually don't have enough money for them to be able to uh, survive, you know. And just like other countries, um, the aging population also take the caregiving roles of their younger generation. So for example, usually si Lolo at si Lola, they would take care of the grandson or the granddaughter when their son and daughter is not around. 
And also, unlike developed countries wherein they already have an industry that is specifically catered to gerontology, to older people, um, like, you know, like uh, elderly care, you know, or, uh, aging homes, in the Philippines, we don't have that as much yet. And also, there's a cultural barrier to that because, again, there's always that responsibility for the younger population and the younger generation to take care of the older population so usually we shun against placing our older relatives to an elderly home because that means that we are in ingrato no we are ingrates to the sacrifices of our parents or our grandparents and uh, that's the reason why you know elder homes have not been making waves in relation to you know having its own industry in the Philippines compared to the United States or United Kingdom. And of course, you know, death. And I think uh, the experiences of death as explained by Nicole is also similar to the Philippines, but I'd like to also introduce a term we call bereavement, and bereavement means it's the culturally sanctioned way of you know dealing with a death. You know, so in the Philippines, we have many superstitions and practices in relation to funerals, and also other other countries and other religions also have their own way of celebrating and mourning uh, the death of their loved ones. So in this video, we were able to learn about race and ethnicity, and we're also able to learn about you know how minority groups are treated in a society and the theories behind it and also we were able to contextualize all these concepts in the philippine society and, and also we were able to learn about age stratification and we were able to contextualize um how aging is in the philippines